Hello, hello to all the amazing people, the Niamh here and welcome to another episode of Olympus Company. Also welcome to my channel, I play a long series of games I really enjoy. If you want to pick one, binge watch it, well, even like and subscribe, that would make me really happy. But otherwise, well, welcome to another episode of Limbus. Of course, you can find the playlist in the comments and description below. And, uh, well, watch it from the start, you have no idea what's going on. So in this episode, I will uh, finish my scrap box thing. I've been doing really well. Turns out getting the scrap was like super easy. I was able to do it really fast. So yeah, like in three or four days, actually. <laughs> what is my secret? Well, there's a couple of things we sped things up, but like it wasn't really key to it. I would definitely advise you to add a whole bunch of people to your playlist and uh, well, not to your playlist, to your <laughs> to your friend list and uh, see if uh, well, see if you can get a. Um, Either Ishmael, Molar Boatworks, e Fixer Ishmael, or Soda Honglu onto your friend list to speed things up, but it wouldn't like be game breaking or anything. I did also go and extract Ishmael, so we have both. So, but anyway, I'm uh, gonna go and gather scrap. Let's see how long does it take. That's 1 minute 20 in the video, so. Gonna click here, gonna click there. I'm gonna change our team a little bit to grab the Honglu. With soda on it, there we go. So we get 40, 20, plus 20, plus 40, like uh, 80, 100, 120 bonus here. Let's check the time again. Almost two minutes. So I've been doing this relatively fast. You don't really have to bring uh, these. You just have need to have them on your roster. But it turns out that's totally fine. So okay, two minutes into the video, let's uh, let's go into the fight and. I'll show you how I was doing it. So I was basically doing it in, I was watching YouTube and doing it on a small screen. I really wanted to limit the things that I would have to micromanage. So the first two waves of the fight, I was just auto combating it, auto combating it. So that part, nothing super spectacular there. And then um, the final part of the fight, like there, there needed to be some like uh, micromanagement, but uh, Oh, super crazy. I'll show you what I did in most of the fights. Sometimes I needed to adapt a little bit, but like most of the time it was like super easy. And I didn't even really go and build a team. Like this is a little bit unfortunate, like this crap winning the clash that definitely like it's gonna increase the duration of this thing by around 20 seconds, but yeah, it's not really a big deal. So yeah, definitely not super grindy. Um, I mean, I had some free time, so I was able to play it for a bit like two or three hours today and uh, same thing yesterday but you know if you spread out during these two weeks when the uh, event is available like it wouldn't be too bad obviously it would be a little bit shorter if you like uh, don't add your people to uh, your people to the friend list we have but it was like surprisingly easy for me like uh, uh, in the previous video or the one before that actually two videos ago like i actually shown the the process of adding a whole bunch of people which had Ishmael as uh, the boat fixer Ishmael as a banner picture. So it was kind of really easy to figure out uh, like who to add in order to uh, well get a desired result really. And this fight is going super bad. <laughs> but yeah, it's gonna be my last fight here. I'm gonna go to get to 4000 and that's gonna mark the, the end of the, that. And then I will uh, some of these are not optimal, but like, as I said, I was just out to combating it and out to combating it and enjoying some YouTube on the side, so... Uh, it's like, just doing this fight over and over again is definitely not the, the the height of my gaming career or anything like that, but yeah. Maybe those fights were also going relatively badly like they are here. I was, just wasn't aware of it because, well, you know, <laughs> wasn't paying attention, so... In any case, that was like, what, four turns? That's decent enough, I would say. My only worry here is that some people will get targeted at really bad points in the fight, but probably not. And, uh, and yeah, so I got a whole bunch of stuff from the event, really happy about it. And then I can finally go and start the uh, Mirror of Mirrors on easy. And then after that, uh, I would go on, uh, on hard. I guess so the next videos will be all about that 
Hopefully I can finish that before the next event or season thing or anything that would distract me once more, but uh, yeah, definitely the next thing on the chopping block. Okay. But yeah, I wasn't really building any type of very specific team that would be super good against scraps. I just used all my star 3Ds that uh, IDs that I got, uh, plus Sinclair, which I got in the event. Didn't really check him in detail, I just, you know, took him along the right. Took me a while to realize somewhere in the message that I actually don't have to have him in the fight for the bonus to, to work, but <laughs> it's okay, I guess. In any case, and uh, then, yeah, it was a little bit tricky to find the, the soda Honglu, so I usually maximize the screen just for that, but that's more or less everything I did. But yeah, so we're getting to the third wave here where the big crap's gonna come and I'm gonna tell you what I did with that part of the fight to make it as fast as possible. So ideally we start the fight with uh, with her staying up and uh, indeed we do. And then uh, we also slow him down with, with him. And then the fourth one, I just put everyone uh, here and we ignore the defense thing. And then uh, yeah, I just make sure uh, my best clasher goes here possible, is dominating. Um, I would somewhat be able to notice that, but like the screen was like maybe... Like this, like this, like one sixth of the screen, so it's really hard to tell. So sometimes the, the third one was really dominating, but you know, it's okay. Any case, usually I would be done in three rounds or so, we'll see how we do this time. Let's see what this hits. This is an AoE, so it's gonna do a lot of damage. That, that's, that was really the key to speed things uh, along realistically. Now, we are not clashing the crabs, so it's like they're gonna do their thing, but it's not really a problem like at all. Okay, and now since I sent everyone onto the third part, uh, onto its shell, now the shell is broken. Now I just have to go and uh, clash with one thing, clash with this thing. Oh, it's too slow. Oh, really? That never happened before. <laughs> this is like a speed of one, so that's the reason why I use his thing. So we can always clash, but doesn't matter, so he's just gonna use hers then. Oh well, <laughs> that's so weird, dude. In any case, and then we send everyone else onto the staggered part. And then uh, he's either dead or we just finish him off in the next round. Super easy uh, and very fast and uh, yeah, really easy fight. Still takes like 8 minutes or so though, with the loading times and the first two parts and everything. So, But yeah, 8 minutes, that means I can do it like, I don't know, we'll do a calculation after the fight. I'll do the calculation. It's gonna be less than 8 minutes. We'll see. Oh, we still need to watch some crab animation, uh, uh, animations. So he has like around, so what, 100 HP left. Okay, now he would be super slow at this point. But now he's not because our Mercer rolled a 1, so that was so. We sent everyone onto this one here. And hopefully we all go before he goes and we kill it before he does his attacks. And that's usually how it went, so... He would be like 1-1-1-1-1 one, 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 one now and... Um, oh, anyway, he does like with one attack anyway, or two, okay. And yeah, that's it. So it's nine, 9 minutes now into the video. So 7 minutes for fight and then this loading screen here and then also picking up... Uh, Finding the Honglu soda, and we got 88 scrap from that. That's pretty good. Right, let's say, let's say seven and a half minutes here. That means you can do it four times in an hour, uh, four, four times in half an hour. So eight times in an hour. So if you calc, if we multiply this, so we got 88 scrap. We multiply this by eight. So that means I can get 700 per hour. And uh, let's say we need like around 3,000. 3,000 divided by 700. That will be like just over four hours. So I wasn't even playing as much as I thought. But yeah, having bonus is like really the key here. So definitely get either Ishmael or Soda on board. Let's say we didn't have one of these two bonuses. 
So let's say we just had uh, uh, let's say we just had like 40 80 percent bonus. That would mean we would not get 88 but uh, 72, right? And then we'll multiply this by eight. That means 576 per hour. So 3000 divided by 576 would be five hours. So without bonus, you would have to like do it for like one hour longer if you had only three bonuses. But yeah, it shouldn't be too hard to get three bonuses. Like uh, you will get uh, you will get these two for free as you go through it. Yeah, obviously, it's gonna be a little bit slower in the start because you don't have these two, right? But I really suggest. Well, I'm giving you all these suggestions and stuff, and by the time you watch this video, the the, the event was all, already over, I guess. Yeah, maybe maybe I should make a short video just like giving these suggestions. Yeah, I wasn't really thinking about that. Oh well. In any case, hopefully you didn't have a too bad time grinding this thing down. Interesting thing though. Interesting thing though. I uh. I have more than 4,000. I wonder if there's like any good reason to go further. In any case, this is how I did it. It was very nice and smooth, not grindy, not too grindy at all. So I'm very happy about it. Customize. Border one. Okay, we got the border. Oh yeah, we got the border. there I'm not sure how noticeable this is but okay okay cool so then uh, we're gonna go through one more thing uh, I got the soda reusher thing and I wanted to use it so I uh, I tier three uh, my reusher even though I didn't have to do that that was a little bit silly but silly but let's go and watch the thing oh not this thing identity archives we're gonna go to reusher here for uh, seven so this is the story we saw offline so i'm gonna show it to you guys now will you enter the seven south section six reusher story yes i will so i don't want you to miss anything that's how nice i am curious co-worker why do you even bother staying in the seven and um, the child was always harsh to others questions while her snappish replies weren't as a result of meticulous calculation, the Seventh Association nevertheless took an interest in that trait of hers. Information dissymmetry. Although the Seventh Association specializes in gathering intelligence, it's never easily shared its knowledge with others on principle. In that sense, the child could be seen as someone discreet, discreet about her info, a woman of few words, if you will. Of course, that wasn't necessarily her intention. It's far more. Uh, it's far more likely that the child just needed an excuse to swing her sword. Yeah, I think so. Hmm. Watch and learn. The child lifted her weapon with an unorthodox posture and got to work. Each spot targeted and touched by her sword was peeled, cut, sliced, and strewn. Pacts. Big art created through swordsmanship. She left a lump of flesh that could no longer be recognized as a human in her wake. So yeah, she painted with her sword. And yeah, that's it. That's the little bit of a uh, uptight tree for a seven section reusher there. Seven south section six reusher story. Uh, oh. Come <laughs> Facts. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, right. And I also noticed another interesting thing here. So we can see their names here. So this one, we don't know how to read. Faust is apparently Valpu Valpur Gisnacht. Sveno Impossible. We don't know this one. Soleil. Revenge. Hers. Pakon. Fogel. O Oitas. And uh, Ungetzifer. Right. Um, oh, there's also this dentist nose we could go through. Yeah, I would much prefer if I start the, the hard dungeon in the next video. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to use the next video to start the Mirror of Mirrors. And this one we'll use just to check things out a little bit, talk a little bit about how we feel and stuff like that. The city. 
I'm not sure where to even start. I guess it's only natural given that I can't tell how much I forgot to begin with. Maybe I'll start by making notes whenever I run into things I don't remember. Limbus Company. Record 1. Limbus Company, the place I work for. Its name that should be the most closely related to me, but it's also the hardest to describe for me. Cause they won't tell me anything. I didn't join the company of my own accord. At first I thought the company's initiative was to find and retrieve the golden bulls, but that only seems to be our department's goals, not the entire company's. Record 2. From what I can tell, each department has its own aims, and there's no common goals shared uh, by all of them. It looks like the company has substantial backing. The company's support was never lacking whenever we got its help, though Rod just seems to have a lot to say about the meals. Okay. Oh, there's more. Okay. Sinners. Record one. Seems to be the term that refers to the 12 people on the LCB's bus with me. Based on conversations I overheard, they appear to have joined the company similar to how I did, but they have been nicknamed like they're bound here somehow. I asked for Julius about the term, but he didn't give me a clear answer. Him and his you'll see in due time, he shut down several questions with remarks like that. Looks like I have no other option here, I've got to write down whatever I learn. Record 2. I think a couple new discoveries about the seniors. First, it looks like senior is specifically used to refer to those who've formed a contract that I had no choice for opting out of with me. And it appears they're the only people I can bring back to life with my clock. Yeah, that's true. Record 3. The seniors might be the ones who can resonate with the golden boss we seek. When we approach one, it seems to reveal the fathoms of the seniors' ego, making us experience their past or peer into their psyche. Yeah, every, car, every chapter is like somehow connected to one of the people we have in our team that the game calls the seniors right then the golden boss record one small branch shaped object that emit a golden glow don't really feel like three branches my head gets these tingling sensations when i ever get close to one whatever these are they actually aren't your ordinary gilded wing twigs that we're made to go after Okay, and then the record two. The sinners seem to experience a kind of dizziness when they get near to this thing. I hear it's called resonating. It might be similar to how I get headaches. Once we return with a bow, Vigilus calls people from some other department to take care of it. When I ask him about this, he just said it's submitted to headquarters, right? Uh, let's, let's close this uh, up. Oh, they, they keep reopening apparently, okay. The LCB, Limbus Company Bus. Its name comes from the fact we're on a bus. <laughs> Feels like they don't put a lot of thought into the name, but the other departments aren't far ahead in terms of sophistication. Well, <laughs> we still need to figure out, is it a bus boat or a boat bus? I still think it's a boat bus. Uh, the team includes people like me and the uh, ones called Sinners, who are sitting back behind, still not used to this word. The purpose is to retrieve things called the Golden Boss from the underground facilities of Lobotomy or whatever the L Corp stood for. I don't know what Golden Boss are, but from the sound of it, some physical objects shaped like three branches. We'll make a separate note when I learn more. And we did, indeed, so... Yeah. Since retrieving golden boss isn't the only job, we are sent to deal with any task on the way to the company's objective that needs capabilities unique to me or the sinners. I'm starting to wonder how this company came to be and why it had to be me and the sinners to do all of this, but Faust won't tell me. She says the security level is too low for me to access the information, but she seems to know something more. Why does a sinner know more about the company when I'm the executive manager? Yeah, that's really weird, isn't it? The LCC, the Limbus Company Clearance, its name comes from the fact they clear things up and out. It was formed to aid the bus teamwork. So there are buddies that help us out. Unlike the sinners, I can't revive them with my powers, which explains the care put into their gear and equipment. Well, some of them still died in the process. The department seems to be split into two teams. The before team, LCCB, handles scouting and preparation work, while the after team, the LCCA, handles gathering and cleaning up what we've done. I haven't met them yet, but the team seem to be divided into several sections if Virgil's phone calls are anything to go by. Met with Effie and Sod from preliminary observation of the before team. So I was like, how didn't we meet any of them? We meet these two. They are dead now though. So yeah, uh, rest in peace. I asked them a few questions when I had the time. I'll try to write down what I learned. Also wanted to ask what exactly they do, but the session got interrupted by Don Quixote suddenly causing a scene. Well, like that's the first time that happened. Effie sighed that pre 
preliminary observation pays the least out of all before team's subsections. Judging from what I heard about the department having far more stuff than the others, they might be treated as expendables. Effie and Sod died during our operation. Well, yeah, they did. The nests, right. Well, to all of those who are not familiar with Library of Ruin and Lobotomic Corporation, this will be some new information. Seems to be a term that refers to urban centers in the city. The city is divided into multiple sections and each of them compromises a nest and a back streets portion. So a nest is like a safe area and back streets is like a lawless area. A nest is basically under the management and protection of a conglomerate called a wing, while the back streets aren't too big of an influence, I think. Ask Virgilius if I came from a nest or the back street, but he ignored me. Well, it sounds like Virgilius, that's for sure. Okay, then we got some information about different uh, Corporations, which are wings, I think, also. K Corp, located in District 11's nest. So it seems like these are Alpha de Betequil. They are not in a in a order that we encountered them. I think this is like the last one we did, right? As evidenced by our nightmarish battle at the checkpoint, K Corp Singularity seems to give us uh, the user the capability to continuously heal or regenerate rather their body. Foss called it Helapo. Yes, but it seems to be more commonly referred to as HP bullets. Yeah, I prefer HP bullets, it's easier to pronounce. <laughs> or ampules by regular denizens of the city. Thanks to that, all the sinners died and I almost fainted bearing 12 people's worth of pain at once. But those HP ampules did also help restore my melted lower half to perfectly good health. K Corp seems to be utilizing this technology for a number of industries. According to Sam Joe, an employee we met at Elmbongs, the Wink might also be developing food-related tech using the Singularity. Chicken wings, yay. L Corp, full name, Lobotomy Corporation. Its nest was in District 12, a fallen wing, its spot currently vacant. It was apparently the epicenter of a city-wide event called the White Nights and Dark Days, which everyone seems to know, except for me, or would that be the Amnesia. The facilities we searched through for the Golden Boss all once belonged to this now defunct L Corp. N Corp. Naglan Hammer, located in District 14's nest. Nagel obviously means nail. Having spoken with Mersault, apparently there are two factions under the names of Nail and Hammer. According to him, the armor-clad Inquisitors we faced were nearly as prevalent when he worked for the Wing, and they weren't the majority faction during the time here, his time there. Unlike the group led by Cromer, N Corp as a whole doesn't appear to be different from other big corporations outside from Riggedness. So Cromer, really bad person. Record 2. Not sure what its main business is, but some seniors seem to know a couple things about the wing. If only they'd speak to me all at all about it. Right. Seems like we didn't read everything. Oh, Lobotomy Corporation. Name of the Al Corp that existed in the past, it was an energy provider. It transported abnormalities like those we've encountered to facilities in their eggy forms and managed them in containment units to produce energy in the form of encephalin. I'm told it once supplied energy to many other companies and wings pretty much all over the city basically so it must have been a pretty whitey enterprise. So yeah, this process of managing abnormalities, there is a game about it called Lobotomy Corporation, surprisingly enough. There's a link to my playlist of playing this game in the description of the video. Then, one day a fierce ray of light shot out of the headquarters and the company went under just like that. I even heard that after the company was gone, some lower thing, appeared in its place and then disappeared sometimes after. The wing spot is still vacant as I write this, which apparently has the whole district in chaos. With its headquarters gone, the branch facilities around the city all shut down and were buried underground. Air Corp, located in District 18's nest. Okay, how many districts are there? More than chapters, apparently more than sinners. Without what I've heard about Air Corp from its related sinners, it seemed a little different from the other wings I know so far. While most wings provide many a convenience by utilizing their singularities to improve people's quality of life, Air Corp mainly deals in armed services like mercenaries. Air Corp's power as wing comes from the quality of its military services. Uh, are there rabbits from there? I think, yeah. Rabbits, rhinos, and uh, reindeers. Otis added that unimportant as the troop size is, much of its strength this battle will come from field experience and mental fortitude. In that sense, this, uh, she says our corps' competent soldiers and employees are like killing machines with undaunted spirits on top of being in great health. Gager said it's common for ordinary soldiers to lose their will to fight and then flee the battlefield or fall into panic, and those who don't are the exceptions. I wonder if our corps runs war games and simulations or something. 
Hearing what our corpse and dentists have to say, the ring has a team called the Fourth Pack with these three subdivisions, rabbits, reindeer and rhinos. The rabbits are all-rounders deployed to a wide range of missions. The reindeer have surgically gained antlers that convert mental strength into physical force. While well, I haven't met rhinos yet, I'm told their specialty is wrecking havoc. So yeah, we can... I learned a lot about all the three of these, either play it with their cards or use their abilities in both Lobotomy Corporation and Library of Ruina playthrough. You can also find the Library of Ruina playthrough in the video's description. The Wings. Companies with the most advanced and influential technology in their districts practically ruling over them. Supposedly, they're corporate entities, but uh, the more I hear about the Wings, the more they sound like governing bodies. Come to think of it, Limbo's company doesn't seem to fit the conventional ideas of a company either. We're on a bus all the time for one. Each Wing has trademark technologies called Signalities and uses the funds earned from them and ridiculous taxes to manage the high-class urban area inside the district known as the Nest. People who work for a Wing seem to be nicknamed the Feathers. Well, yeah, Feathers of a Wing. Then we got the V Corp. The Warp Corporation, using warp trains, <laughs> located in District 23's nest. I haven't visited their place yet, but I learned a thing or two about it from conversations with the entities from this wing. V Corp seems to be operating a transit service as advertised as warp trains that take passengers from platform to platform in mere seconds. Tickets for warp trains are apparently pretty costly, and I'm told the first class ones are plain ridiculous. Well, there's an advantage of being a first class, though. Shouldn't you just cut the cost and drive at that point maybe i think i agree with that especially since we know what happens in those trains writing down additional details i've heard while cars can take you anywhere warp trains are preferred because travel by car can get incredibly complicated makes sense considering the procedures we went through just to get into k corp's nest Speaking more, it seems the bigger problem is the roads are made inefficiently. They're so twisted and convoluted that it takes an unreasonable amount of time to travel between back streets areas by car. Even if the linear distance is short, the road is to the destination will be labyrinthine. Labyrinthine? Pfft, that's not a word. Pur purportedly, there are wide open roads called highways connecting the nest, but that comes with a set of conditions and costs as well. Learned a shocking fact while taking talking with seniors down up in V-Corp's identities. Though they didn't tell me directly, it seems that the trips on warp trains, which take no more than a few minutes from an outsider's perspective, make their passengers perceive a terribly long amount of time, dissolving their sanity and deforming them beyond recognition once the ride is finally over. Then it's the job of a cleanup agent to physically sort out the mess every time. Thank goodness we have a bus. Yes, that's true. This is all speculation based on conversation with identities, so I'm planning to keep this information to myself. Well, yeah. Here we got the fixers. The muscles of the city, the contractors, sort of freelancers who take care of or help with various jobs and requests in the city. They don't work for free, of course. The whole society seems to be based around money, but uh, I don't think I can say for sure that there are absolutely no fixers willing to do charity work, I guess. The ones I've seen and heard about were all from walks of life, too diverse for me to neatly summarize. If talking with mirrored identities counts too, maybe it's a common career. Well, it is actually, I think. Apparently, you can't be a fixer just because you want to. Some fixer-related identities told me that there are tech you need to pass to earn a license. Looks like fixers are graded with a number, 9 being the lowest and 1 being the highest. There's also a special grade called being a color. Virgilius appears to be one. He has the moniker of the raid case. He's supposedly pretty skilled and famous. Offices. So this is where the fixers work. Term that encompasses all the corporate bodies or any place of business, really, that are founded by fixers. There seems to be some sort of rule that requires fixers to be part of an authorized organization of any kind if they want to work. And setting up a one-person office is apparently an option. Well, yeah. <laughs> okay, then, well, you know. What does it matter then, right? It looks like, so it's just bureaucracy. It looks like there's a pretty wide variety of offices. Thinking back on the time we were in the back streets of District 4, the Corpse territory, the office Yuri and I belong to might have been the most common type. Anyways, I guess I can say fixers, offices, associations are all entities that handle requests for a price. True. The associations seems to refer to the large organizations that manage fixers. Each association appears to have a specific field it specializes in to account for how free and open a fixer's line of work can usually be. There's pretty wide variety. I've seen a few associations through the identities of sinners and their mere worlds. One major difference from freelance fixers is that they can't choose the jobs they want to take. So we've got a couple of associations here. 
sync association. They seem to specialize in single combat and dueling requests. Though it doesn't happen often, I hear there are still cases of people trying to settle disputes with a fair and honorable duel. When a person gets involved in a duel or has to challenge someone to it and figures their opponent will clearly tear them apart, uh, tear them a new airway, they send this association request. Sounds like they stand in for the client or something. All I know about association comes from what I've heard from the seven association entities, so I couldn't learn much. Since association doesn't get regressed too often, it seems to be in charge of holding joint conferences and events with other associations as well. Liu Association. They seem to specialize in combat requests and involve groups of people, so they are they're like a war war kind of thing. Military association. Although few fixers in the city go their lives without once ever embroiling themselves in battle, quoted from Don Kui, the Leo Association seems to be unique in that each individual member is equipped to deal with multiple foes at once. According to Don Quixote's, discerning the two may yet be a task to daunting for novice aficionados, she also added, while the Sphinx Association covers one-on-one -on -one situation like duels, the Leo Association handles engagements between multiple combatants. Come to think of it, most of those identities did seem to value cooperation and coordination over individual action. They also looked rather carefree too. Gregor's Leo Association identity also told me that it was common for him to take on groups of five or six at once. He didn't forget to proudly mention that He'd whooped those kids, he needs. Another thing of note is the incendiary devices built into all their weapons. When I asked why they use fire starting weaponry, they gave me varying answers like harmony or flow. But those honestly felt like roundabout remarks. In my opinion, it's probably because fire is effective as a means to strike foes around the target. Flames can spread, after all. Then finally we got the Assassination Association, the C, uh, the She Association. They seem to specialize in assassination requests. Should note that it doesn't exactly mean they're the only fixers who will ever take assassination jobs. To start requesting an associate fixer is gonna cost a fortune. Plus, the demand for assassination is awfully high in the city, so even unknown offices on obscure streets seem to get those requests pretty often. Then we go to syndicates. Seems to be what they call all kinds of gangs and organizations in the city. This term covers such a wide range of things, you can call pretty much any group of people together under the name a syndicate. Okay, the back streets, areas of district not included in the nest, outside of the wing's domain. The residents are mostly people who can't afford to live in the nest. Each area is stacked with restaurants, local businesses, living quarters, schools, academies, and a variety of other facilities. As the name suggests, though, the road tends to be twisted and intertwined, and there's a constant air of dampness whenever you go. Fun thing I've noticed is that the boundaries between the back streets and the nest were clearly drawn in every district I visited, though I've only been to like three of them. Yeah, you know where you belong. The Blade Lineage. A syndicate of sword-wielding ruffians and libertines roaming the back streets. Guessing from conversations with the seniors who wore such identities, they don't seem to act or move in groups much despite belonging to a syndicate. To be more precise, they do have temporary company from time to time, but there is no strict subgroups or pecking order. It's unfortunate that the half of their answers were taking the piss, so I'm unable to write proper answers here. <laughs> For Dante, for Dante, the Kurokomo clan, a giant syndicate spread deep and wide across the back streets. They seem to be characterized by long single-edged swords with sheets and dark wavy clothes. They basically earn their keep by taking protection fees from back streets businesses under the pretext of offering safety. Right, so they are... Uh they're money bullies, they're protection bullies. From what I heard from the identities, they seem to be into some kind of, they're mafia basically. They seem to be in some kind of conflict with another syndicate called the Blade Lineage. I didn't get to hear the reason. They follow same some sort uh, same some sort of hierarchy and henchmen are generally forbidden from disobeying their superiors. They do seem to be special exceptions if Hong Lu is to be believed. Right, and then finally the city technology. From turning rudimentary cocks to overlaying an alternate identity via mirror, the city has every level of technology. Right, so let's go through these. We got abnormalities. I still don't think I can exactly define what abnormality is. So far, the ones I've encountered, for now anyway, usually had an appearance unlike any human or animal and possessed extraordinary powers. Their beings should only expect to see in abnormal fantasi fantasies, both in terms of what they look like and what they can do. They're pretty scary. Some of them more powerful than others, though. When I tried asking Faust, and she kept saying abnormalities are entities of their own category, you shouldn't attempt to define them based on any preconceived standards and refuse to give more detail answer. Well, classical force there. The old L Corp used to classify abnormalities into five levels. 
Yuri told us that Alcorp created them based on their energy production efficiency. Limbo's company seems to use the same levels to categorize them. So yeah, it's like Zine, Tet, HE, uh, Vav, and Aleph, basically. Then we got Egos. Shorthand for extermination of geometrical organ. Sick, I don't know what this means. Seems to be a byproduct of the encephalin generation once done by the now col collapsed Alcorp. Reports say that the wing originally produced weapons and equipment out of the ego for its employees to use. It doesn't really seem to match what I've seen of it. Well, we did see people well building egos in chapter 4 though, so. From what I can tell, the ego of our sinners use appears to work by the user making the emotions of self-identity of the abnormality they own, although I haven't experienced it myself. I've heard a few times that it feels similar to being influenced by someone else's thoughts and reflecting it to life, walking as if in their shoes. However, if you don't stop at just being convinced and get deeply engrossed in that other sense of self, you'll be taken over by what's carrying it. That killed the sinners a good few times and hurt me like hell. Yeah, we had a couple of... <laughs> Uh, instances of people getting like corroded by the egos and attacking the team. Yeah. Encephalin seems to be what the glowing green fuel originally produced by Lobotomy Corporation is called. Mephistopheles has a device converting humans into encephalin built into it, and the green liquid filling up the tube seems to be just that. Encephalin can also be stored in containers of our choice for easier transport, boxes and modules being the two vital examples. Yeah, except I can I can turn them into modules, but I can only turn boxes into encephalin not the other way around. So boxes we can get from various sources in the game, but... The old L Corpse logo can still be seen on the bottom of some encephalin boxes, which probably means the wing used them as well. We think that, yeah, uh, they, we used boxes to unlock egos, actually, I believe. Reading the warning on the side, well, all the encephalin in the Lobotomy Corporation was stored in these boxes and used as currency, right? Reading the warning on the side, ingesting it apparently has hallucinogenic effects. Who would think to do that? Well, employees did it to co to like came to terms with their harsh realities identities an invention that overlays a person's identity with a different possibility from numerous other worlds so basically parallel universes i heard Yi sang was one of the uh, its developers but he always blabbers things i can't wrap my hand around and there are asks so i don't expect to get any useful down-to-earth info from him so yeah we saw this this process in chapter 4. The identities themselves are found via the engine of Mephistopheles. Not sure how it works, but it looks like you can't just find and grab the identities you want. Well, you can if you have enough shards. <laughs> Trials and error can sometimes stumble upon previously unseen versions of the sinners too. Right, so this is basically explaining the extraction process, I guess. But you can get the one you want if you use shards, so... That's good. Although I can't write how exactly those identities are used in full, feels like attempting to makes me unsure somehow. Synchronizing the extracted identity with my LCB PDA in the pass window allowed me to communicate with or fill it in a way. Calling for the image of the identity in my mind, I get a sense of understanding as if I'm talking to the sinner like usual. And once the sinner and I make an unspoken agreement, the identity overrides the sinner, accompanied by the sound of glass shattering. Can't think of a more suitable description. So yeah, this is how we equip the identities onto the sinners, right? Well, overlaid with an identity, the sinner appears pretty different from usual. On top of attires and weapons, their personalities can also change pretty wildly and sometimes make me question if they're really the sinners I know. Fortunately, well, they're not. They're the identities, they possess them, right? Fortunately, they seem to go back to their original selves when they are done using an identity. But prolonged use might cause small side effects like headaches or residual traces of the identity's personality surfacing from time to time. Well, that's interesting. Identity uptying. A process of synchronizing an identity with this world using the thread we've gathered. It's how one brought from a different world is tuned to the sinner in ours and becomes more powerful as a result. I guess it could be linked, likened to binding the two worlds together. From what I can tell, a freshly excited identity can't immediately transfer all of their knowledge and combat prowess to the sinner. That's why thread must be used to uptie the identity and make it more effective. So this explains why we have to uptie our identities, basically. I ask if the max uptie status as shown on the PDA is really the highest possible tier, and probably not. 
because like it was maximum one was three and now it's already four and who knows in the future it might be five six we'll see i wanted to know if that meant that the sinner ritually becomes the same as the one from another world i've been told it's theoretically the case if an identity brought from a certain point in time of the world from where it was extracted gains more experience training their combat skills further for example a new possibility can occur that allows for additional stages of up dying i guess that's to mean identities from a certain point in time could grow stronger in terms of experience and technique I ask if events differing from our timeline happen in the worlds from where the identities are extracted as time passes. I've been told that we can't know for sure and that it doesn't matter anyway. Limbo's company is only interested in enhancing the sinner's capabilities in battle so they don't care about what happens with identity or its world as we uptie them. Okay. Singularities, simply put, some kind of incredible technology owned by the Wings. I was curious how they're different from their other technologies in the city. I guess it's the fact that singularities are monopolized by the Wings that own them. Record 2. Another thing of note is that they almost seem to be outside the realm of logic or classical physics. Foss says it's necessary to bother thinking about the intricacies of my current state by... Uh, I don't think you can brush off flesh regrowing from a severed arm or stickers that boost your luck as things that just work that way. Wait, is my head a singularity too? Well... Singularities are a mystery, aren't they? Yeah, they are definitely monopolized. And uh, usually they have a, some kind of a dark secret behind it, so... Yeah, I don't think they're just like normal technologies. There's something that takes a lot of sacrifice and weird stuff to make it work. Threads, so these we use to uptie. A strangely shaped object is inside kind of like a bulb-like thing. I don't know how I should describe it, it sometimes wiggles and twitches. I would definitely not describe it as a bulb if it twitches, no? Staring into the glimmering thread makes me feel rather woozy. Faust wouldn't let me hold it in my hands for long, but so I put it back in place and let her explain what it is. In summary, it's all sorts of possibilities woven into spineless of threads or something like that. To be frank, I can't really call this a summary when I just wrote down what Foss said almost word for word. I couldn't understand what she meant exactly. It gives me a similar feeling to looking up at a star that appears when I win the clock, sort of like Ave. Well, I think the most important thing is uh, to like know what it is used for. So, yeah. Thread spinning. Similar to uptying, this is a process of making the sinner's ego more powerful using thread. Though I do wonder why the stress spinning and not uptying again. Well, well, maybe this will explain it. Like identities, the egos used by the sinners are possibilities drawn from the course of certain abnormalities for appropriate individuals. However, using ego to its full potential requires weaving together a deep understanding and well-read interpretation of the abnormality, which is why it's called thread spinning. Sort of like the idiom of spinning a yarn. Thread spinning an ego enriches the comprehension of the abnormality's mental imagery, enhancing its power and effectiveness. Ego seems to be the manifestation of some kind of mental force. I guess it makes sense that forming through our knowledge of the abnormality in its ego is important. While Thread's role in uptying is to connect people's between worlds, it seems to work like a wire to unravel the core of the abnormality in Thread spinning. Foss says we might be able to Thread spin egos beyond what we're currently capable of in the future. <laughs> so yeah, opening themselves uh, chances of when new updates and stuff. Similar to upgrading and uptying identities, gathering golden boss should allow us to decipher and interpret them in further detail. Upgrading identities. Leveling them up, right? When the sinner tears, tears this identity training ticket, certain experiences seem to flow into them or the identity they're wearing. Those experiences can make them even stronger than how they were in their original worlds at the time of extraction. Well, that's what the relevant theories say, according to Faust. I get that they become better fighters with the added experience, but how does it make them physically stronger too? Well, yeah, that's a good question, isn't it? Well, maybe they're not physically stronger maybe they just use their strength in better capabilities so they it seems like they're stronger even though they're actually not maybe i got vague but sometimes sensible answers from Faust and Yisang. when an identity is upgraded using tickets the identity's frame itself is enhanced so the game's like no no there is an explanation for it all right to summarize their explanations upgrades exclusively improve their physical traits the improvements are made in ways that would have worked in original worlds the identities come from additionally when an identity with prosthetics is upgraded the materials and components of them seem to get sturdier and whatnot either way upgrades are focused wholly on physical improvements interesting 
I ask if it's possible to upgrade identities beyond their current maximum level, 30 as of writing. Well, it's 35 now, as shown on the PDA. This value seems to be related to the golden balls we're collecting. In addition, I was told that I'd be unable to withstand further upgrades for now. Well, we can do it already. 35 being the maximum level in season 2. Does that mean it will be possible to upgrade them more at a later point? Come to think of it, if these level ups are the only for making their physical bodies stronger, then why are these things called training tickets? I thought that was covered by Aptis. Yeah, well I know, very very confusing. In any case, that's gonna be it for the lore here and... Uh, my throat is dry, the time is like 45 minutes and I will end the video here, so I hope you enjoyed my reading through the little bit of a lore, giving a little bit of comments, nothing super crazy though, but yeah, if you want me to comment further, you can ask in the comments, and I'm sure Zero Seek can zero we have some inputs of his own as well. But yeah, hopefully enjoyed the episode, next episode will either be a very short, no, the next episode will definitely be a, um, a mirror of mirrors. And I'm actually thinking of making a really short video guide for the Magic Hell bus and release it way, 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 way before this video gets released. Well, by the time you watch this video, we will both know if I actually did it. If you enjoyed the video, don't forget to like and subscribe. I wish you to have a wonderful day. Do something nice, be kind to each other, and let's make the world a better place together. Thank you all for watching, and see you in the next episode of Limbo's Company. The new Mersani out. Bye -bye.